Hello, everyone. Welcome back into another episode of Sports Talk Chicago. My name is Joey Christopoulos. You can follow me at Joey Sports Guy. Thank you so much for coming into the program. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe below. Or if you're listening podcast form, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts on Google, Apple, Spotify. And I also want to give a shout out to our wonderful radio affiliates across the great state of Illinois broadcasting Sports Talk Chicago today, 98.3 The Life, WKAN, 105.5 The Ticket, ACTV, Jed TV, WJOB, WROK in Rockford, Cities 92.9 Talk FM, and 101.1 Peoria Sports Radio. I'm going to be doing a recap of Hard Knocks and also going to be talking about the Chicago Cubs. Whether we like it or not, they're back at 500. They're crawling back into the wild card race. Can they make that push to make it? I'm going to cover a little bit of all the components that it's going to take to get them there. But first, I want to talk a little bit about Hard Knocks and the Chicago Bears. Look, we still have one more week to go. Next week, I am definitely going to be doing my full season preview with my win total prediction. I did one a couple months ago when the schedule came out. Let's see if it's changed. Let's see if it's gotten better. It's gotten worse. So right now, all we really have to do is just talk about hard knocks and count down the days until the Chicago Bears season begins. I find the discourse on hard knocks with the Chicago Bears to be very interesting. Sometimes I feel like there's a lot of fans that have never seen past seasons before. I feel like that some of them that are fans of the show are a little bit too much caught in the past of the Rex Ryan version of hard knocks. And we're going to dive into some of those elements. But the first thing I want to talk about is just going through some of the episode. One of my criticisms, and I'm going to also clap back at other people's criticisms of this season, is that I felt like one of my favorite parts of Hard Knocks is that when we get that opportunity to actually get into those coaching rooms, get into those film rooms with those players, and watch the coaches interact with the players, and then watch the coaches interact with other coaches and general managers, about the ceiling and kind of the yay or nay on a player in the room. Haven't gotten a ton of that yet this season. We started getting a little bit of that in this past episode as the Chicago Bears are trying to cut down to their 53-man roster. I'll be honest with you. As a football nerd, I am a little bit of a sucker for those coaches mumbling about players in a room. We got a little bit of that. And you can kind of tell that the Hard Knocks production crew got some of the answers to the test with some of the people that they featured in this episode, namely guys like Ian Wheeler, and most importantly, a guy like Valus Jones, who made the team 53-man roster, made it as a wide receiver, probably going to be used as a dual threat from the running back and wide receiver position. And then can you even trust the guy in special teams? I highly doubt it, but hopefully he's going to be an X-factor that's going to help us out. I've been hearing a lot about this particular episode being boring or this season be boring for the Chicago Bears. And look, I, I have to tell you, we're all entitled to our opinions. And that's the beauty of life. We're all going to have a wide variety of where we land on different topics and different feelings. But honestly, if you didn't, if you thought that last night's episode was boring, what are you trying to get out of this? Hard Knocks is not succession, okay? Hard Knocks is not Game of Thrones. Hard Knocks is not Sex in the City. Hard Knocks is not Law and Order. I mean, it's a show that's supposed to chronicle the players and their journeys through an NFL training camp and try and give you a behind-the-scenes peek of who they are as human beings. And that's what last night's episode was about, players as human beings. You got a great story about Adrian Colbert who has a very interesting personality, believes a lot about his own internal constitution of how he approaches life as a human being and as a player, but the harrowing story of him being hit by a car at 55 miles an hour as a child, surviving, recovering, and having an opportunity to play on different teams throughout the NFL for, I believe they said, eight seasons. I mean, it's an incredible story. And then, of course, the piece about Ian Wheeler. Now, for those of you that haven't been watching preseason, and this is typical for most NFL teams every year, there's there's always a guy who's going to come out of nowhere and push somebody else for a spot on the team. And he plays so well in the preseason that it makes it difficult on the coaches, and they have to make a decision. Now, whether that player ends up playing a role in the regular season or not is a little bit up in the air. 
And if you play fantasy football, you can get, you know very well, you can get too bought into guys that have great preseasons. But as we saw throughout the preseason, Ian Wheeler was fantastic out of the backfield, running the ball and catching the ball, caught a touchdown in the last game. And he was making a real push to make the team. I really enjoy the interactions that he had with Chad Morton, the running backs coach. And I, I, I loved how they featured all the different coaching staff players on that team. So I don't understand why we're calling this boring. This is a guy who's pre-med, who's trying to make a go at it in football. And one day he will be a doctor, but right now his body, his physical, his physical God-given talent is allowing him to be able to play the game that he loves. And he's making a push for the team. The coaches are pushing him hard, and he's getting results out of it. And then in the final moments of, or excuse me, in the second half, the final preseason game for the Bears, Helmet hits his knee. You could hear him on the audio. Gasp in pain. Gets up, hobbles off the field. Goes back, he immediately knows something is wrong. Goes back to the training room and gets the type of news that no football player ever wants to hear. Torn ACL. Concurrently, Hard Knocks is also filming his mom in the stands rooting him on. Obviously, his mother, his biggest fan in the whole world. And they also catch on camera her receiving the news via text. Or maybe she saw it on Twitter that Ian Wheeler suspected probable torn ACL. Now, for any player, I don't care what sport you play, torn ACL's got to be up there with the worst two words that you can possibly hear. Former Bears defensive end, my co-host, Corey Wooten, has talked about tearing his ACL before, and I, I think what immediately jumps into your mind, I don't know for Ian Wheeler is my career over, I think for Ian Wheeler, I think it immediately goes, oh man, this is the next 12 to 18 months of my life. And a lot of people in this life get that type of news that immediately goes, man, my life is going to be different from this moment forward for this extended amount period of time. And Hard Knocks was there to capture that. I thought it was pretty poignant, to be honest with you. After the game... He shares a very long hug with his mother as they provide words of comfort and trying to rationalize and, and say that everything has timing and everything has a plan to it. And, and I thought it was touching. And then he gets brought into Ryan Pace's office. Excuse me, Ryan Poles' office. Oh, Lordy. I promised myself I wasn't going to do that all summer, and I just did it. Ryan Poles. Ryan Poles' office. And... Turns out that they want to keep him around. They're going to place him on injured reserve. Obviously, there's going to be some machination that might have to take place throughout the season, but placing him on injured reserve, he's going to get a chance to stay with the team. He's going to get a chance to learn behind the scenes. He's going to rehab his butt off, and hopefully he can come back, and we'll see if he has an NFL career. But when we talk about hard knocks, we talk about being boring, we talk about the access. That's the type of access that you are trying to expect from a show like that, real human stories, Real people trying to get their dream, go on that journey. And there's sometimes there's those moments where that journey gets delayed. That dream gets stalled. And that is the case with Ian Wheeler. I thought it was really great stuff. Typically in Hard Knocks, you will see them go home with a player or at least kind of like do this little walkthrough, a little tour with training camp. I don't know if we're going to get that at some point. Again, I keep calling for it, but it is a little fascinating that we haven't spent any time with Montez Sweat yet. Not, I mean, a couple of cutaways from 25, 30 feet away, but not a lot of Montez Sweat yet. Been very interesting. I hope they do a little bit on him. And the other one, the big winner. So Ian Wheeler, obviously big winner of the episode last night, even though he did get injured. Um, I think a lot of Chicago Bears fans are rooting for him and supporting him and sending him good vibes to get as healthy as he quick, as he, quickly as he can. Another quick shout out to a winner, Austin Reed. This guy, hashtag king. Austin Reed. Look, I love I love athletes with personality. And, and look, I think it's harder to come by than, than people realize because for these professional athletes, you have to understand that they are getting up every single day, 
with a routine, with a regiment, with a training plan, and they, they work out and they work on their craft all day long. And then they eat food. They go back. They work on their craft. They work out some more. They train some more. And then they're done, and then that's it. There's a lot of isolation that comes with training as an athlete at times. You can kind of tell some of the basketball guys, you can tell they're just shooting jumpers all day long. They're not really talking and interacting with people. They're not like, look, I, I played in high school. I love playing softball, but they're not like me and you who loves having conversations in a car about, you know, your favorite top 10 Tarantino movies, you know, arguing about this, that back and forth. Um, understanding what it means to to uh, give somebody a hard time, give somebody a little a friendly insult and to take one back in. It's kind of, I mean, these athletes sometimes don't get that opportunity because they're training so hard and they're so focused on their dream and their task at hand. So when you see a guy like Austin Reed have a personality and be funny, man, is it refreshing and man, do you want to root for him? Now, obviously, Austin Reed did not make the team. Um, I'm hoping that the Chicago Bears probably acquire him back as a practice player. Of course, once you get rid of a player, he can't talk to other NFL teams and make his decision based on what he thinks the best fit is for him. But I do hope the Bears bring him back to the practice field. But I, I, I'm going to paraphrase. But my favorite part is he comes into the game. The Chicago Bears have been kicking everybody's butt all preseason. And he walks over and he goes, guys, listen to me right now. This is the moment. It's time to take it home. They talk about the Patriots dynasty. They talk about the 85 Bears. They talk about the Pittsburgh Steel Curtain. But do they talk enough about the 2024 Bears preseason, the preseason Bears? And everyone, everyone, everyone laughs and gets it, but there's an energy to it. And I like that brevity. I like that lightness. Um, I like someone that, look, we, we take everything too seriously at times. Even when you're trying your hardest, even when you're competing your hardest, you also have to remember that there's, there's another day, there's another opportunity, and there's people in your life that, that care about you and support you a lot. And I just love to see that from Austin Reed on the field. I'm rooting for the guy. I hope he sticks around. My final one is I want to comment on the no swearing, the no cussing in hard knocks. My honest opinion is that I think it was a, I think it's a mistake. And and here's what I will say. Look, I understand that there's probably a lot of families and people that are watching Hard Knocks Hard Knocks that can now watch it with their uh their younger children, 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. Um so to sanitize that I think is a plus. It probably helps bring in a bigger audience. It probably as a whole is good for Hard Knocks in general. And I'm not saying I need the Rex Ryan type of stuff. But what I am saying is, I'm just saying, it's just kind of lame of the McCaskies. I mean, we can't even do a bleep, can't even do a bleep out. And I think it makes it difficult on the Hard Knocks production crew. Because if you're telling me that you can't use anything with a curse word in it, and they're trying to avoid even bleeping out the curse words, I mean, it makes it difficult and it can remove something that's actually interesting out of it if you, if you can't clean it up and keep the context of what's happening. So I, I don't know. I mean, look, I respect anybody and all the deci anybody's decision to, to not want to swear in their life. Apparently, that is the McCaskey motto. Their family does not curse. Therefore, that was one of their stipulated mandates. If Hard Knocks was going to come in with their camera crew, that they didn't want to see any swearing in the final cut. Um, I understand that from a McCaskey perspective, that that is a want. But again... You can't just put on rose-colored glasses and, and, and whisk something away. It is disingenuous to not even show it, to think that they're not even going to be cursing, to think that grown NFL men don't get upset. You also notice there was a fight at practice. They didn't put that in the episode either. Um, that's usually a staple of hard knocks. They seem to kind of omit that. So I understand um, – principles and values the McCaskey family wants to have. I totally I totally get that, but you can't necessarily push that onto every single player in your organization and every single employee. And then to have that then pushed onto the editorial aspect of what your final cut is going to be, I think it's kind of lame. I'm just going to say it. I don't think it's very 
it's not even about being cool. I, I, I find it to be almost selfish in a way where the McCaskies don't want to watch it. So therefore bears fans can't see it. There's a filtering going on there that just doesn't sit great with me. I mean, I get it. It's not the end of the world. I don't hear cussing. I do hear cussing. I'm not going to think one way or the other, but the fact that the McCaskies kind of made that a mandate, it's just kind of strange. And it sort of takes away from the show just a little bit knowing that the content hasn't changed. I've enjoyed Hard Knocks. I mean, I get it. It's not going to be for everyone. It never was for everyone. And it's going to continue that way. Even if you are a Bears fan, I understand if you find it to be kind of boring or maybe go through the motions. Or, But my question for you, maybe throw in the comments on YouTube here, is what exactly did you want to see that you're not seeing? Um. Do you want to see Shane Waldron criticize Caleb Williams in a film room? Do you want to see more of the interaction with the players off the field at home? Is the cursing thing a big deal for you? So I don't know. Hop in the comments and let me know what your thoughts are. I understand everyone's opinion on this. Again, this is not supposed to be the wire. Um, this is not supposed to be the bear. Right. So it's not supposed to entertain you at every single second along the way. But I am curious to see, is there something that you saw there that's lacking? Um, because I, I find it to be quite enjoyable. And to be honest with you, think about it like this. It could be way worse, Bears fans. It could be way worse. We're finishing up a 4-0 preseason. We're finishing up a preseason where the Bears outscored their opponents by 68 points. There's a tweet out there today that the the last six teams that outscored their opponents in the preseason by more than 60 points, all six of them made the playoffs, and two of them went to the Super Bowl. The seventh team is the Chicago Bears. Imagine if that was opposite. Imagine if they played poorly. Imagine if they were 0-4. Imagine if someone got hurt. Imagine if Caleb was bad. You know, imagine... Roma Dunze is late to practice. I mean, go down the list here. We can we can criticize all that we want, but also I try and look back with a perspective and be a little grateful that they did just cover a 4-0 preseason. It definitely could have been way worse. The Chicago Bears are exactly where they need to be right now. Whether that's going to turn into regular season results, we're about to find out in about 10 days. But until then, look, I think our Hard Knocks has been a good run. The swearing thing kind of bothers me a little bit, but I can get over it. And keep in mind that these are human beings being told with human stories. And Hard Knocks has always been about lower people on the roster and trying to tell their stories about how hard it is to be a professional athlete. I think they've done an admirable job of doing that. And I did like the last episode. And I, for one, did not think it was boring. I want to talk about the Chicago Cubs. And I feel like that this is going to, draw some reactions from some people because I seem to, now that I live here, I talk to a lot of Chicago Cubs fans, even people in bars, people that pass by, and everyone seems to have buried the Chicago Cubs. The season is over. There's no way that they can come back. Period. End of sentence. I'm going to go the other way. I think the Chicago Cubs got a great shot at making the postseason. Are they going to do it? I don't know. I'm happy to be wrong, but look, they're at the point now where I think that they've started to come together as a team a little bit and they know who they are. Now, granted, I'm taping this on a Wednesday at about 1.30. Kyle Hendricks is getting pounded. They face Paul Skeens. Kind of a tough matchup. It's a go-away game. Ho-hum. They've been taking two out of three from a lot of teams now for about a week and a half, which is what you want to do in a baseball season, but obviously they're trying to play a little catch-up right now. They need to try and fit a couple sweeps in there for sure if they can. They have an opportunity to do it. They got the Nationals coming up. They play the Pirates again at home. Got to finish up strong. And I will get to Kyle Hendricks in a second. But as it stands right now, they're at 67 and 66 as of this taping. Five games out of the wild card. If we want to be honest with ourselves, I don't know if 84, 85 wins gets it done. I think probably... If we're being honest with ourselves, I think somewhere probably in the 86 to 87 range 
is probably what's going to have to happen. So Chicago Cubs are, are going to have to get hot, and they're going to have to get it done. Some good news is obviously the Atlanta Braves, they continue to have injury after injury. They continue to struggle. Do I really think San Francisco or the Mets are really the type of competition that's going to get on a hot streak and run away with that third wild card spot? I don't. I think they're going to stick there with the Cubs the whole time. St. Louis Cardinals continue to kind of be who they are. Um, they've fallen back a little bit. The Chicago Cubs are now ahead of them. Wipe off the division. We're not winning the division. They're nine games out of the division, but it's the five games to the wild card that is doable. It is. It can be done. It has happened in baseball before. So I'm going to kind of go through a little bit. I'm going to go player by player, rotation through the lineup, catch you up a little bit on a little bit on what's been going on with each guy, what we need from them moving forward, and whether these guys, who exactly is going to be some of these X factors here moving forward that's going to help try and get them over the top. I have to admit, I am an optimist. Am I going to be shocked if they don't make the playoffs? Of course not. But I do think they can get in there if a couple of things bounce their right way. And the first one that's going to start here is Justin Steele. Now, Justin Steele got off to a rough start last night, made him wash his hands in Pittsburgh. Okay, well, gamesmanship. Didn't pitch his best baseball, but they picked up a win. And this is important because Justin Steele days last year were automatic wins for the Chicago Cubs. And that has not been the case this season. And I, I think that's what's been so difficult or maybe confusing or frustrating about this Cubs season to that point. When Justin Steele was on the mound last year, the Chicago Cubs won. This season, not so much. They started just on days when Justin Steele pitched. They started off the season one and eight. One and eight. Luckily, now that they're back to 500, I wonder how they've gotten back into winning on the days when Justin Steele pitches. And oh yeah, Justin Steele has been awesome. 12 of his last 15 starts since June 1st, he's allowed two or fewer runs. Dude's an ace. He's a frontliner. So when your frontliner's out there, you got to win. They started off the season one and eight. After last night's win, they're now 10 and 12. That's a good turnaround. If the Chicago Cubs want to make it to the playoffs, they can't lose too many more days when Justin Steele is on the mound. And that isn't always on Justin Steele, right? Even if he's having a tough day, he gives up three runs, battles, gives you six innings, three runs. You got to score some runs and be able to win on those days because those days are important. Because the next guy who pitched so well to start the season has moved backwards. And I believe that, look, he's a solid starter. But when, we talk, when we're talking about Jamison Tyone, that he's an offense day. Your offense needs to show up. It's been up and down all season, but now when Jamison Tyone's on the mound, the team is 11 and 12, which is pretty much indicative of where they are now. They're one game over. They're one game under with him on the mound. So with Jamison Tyone in general, I, I, I think you need to score five runs. It wasn't the case to start the season. Tyone actually had a great start, pitching some of his best ball of his career. 16 of his first 17 starts, he had allowed three or fewer runs. Those are quality starts every single time out there, 16 to 17. It has not been like that recently. And the biggest problem with Jamison Tyone has been the home run ball. And as we all know in baseball, you let a couple guys on, you give up that deep one, score gets out of control pretty quickly. And that's what's happened to Jamison Tyone the last couple starts. Over his last six games, he's allowed eight home runs. He allowed 20 all season. Eight in his last six games. In five of his last six starts, he's allowed four or more runs. Cubs fans, if we're going to make it to the postseason, I'm just saying I, 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 we need Jamison Town to pitch a little bit better. I'm just saying I think the expectation is on those days when he pitches, I think we need those five runs. I think that's going to be the way to do it. I don't think expecting him to come on and shut people down. It's a little bit of a toss up right now. So Justin's still good. Tyon a bit in the middle. Let's keep moving. 
Let's go to Javier Assad. Now, Javier Assad, team record 13 and 11. Early on in the year, I think they won five straight of his starts. He's six and four, 3.15 ERA, which is pretty good. But his FIP number is 4.49. For the layman, FIP is basically if you take all the other kinds of outcomes, the general outcome of a baseball game, 4.49 should be closer to Javier Assad's ERA than the 3.15. So he's gotten a little lucky in some areas. The problem with Javier Assad a little bit is that he's at the point right now where, man, if you get five innings out of him, that's a deep start for Javier Assad. He's probably four or five innings pairing him with somebody else to come in and bridge the gap just to get to the seventh inning. And man, over the next couple of weeks, if they could just get one player back and have him be healthy and stay healthy for the rest of the season, I'm going to go with Jordan Wicks. Jordan Wicks, you know, not a top end rotation guy just yet, but man, he, he was going out there. He was battling. I really like his change up a lot. And if you could either pair him with the sod or replace him with Kyle Hendricks. I think he can give you some quality innings that the Chicago Cubs are desperately going to need, especially early in games moving forward. The good news for Javier Assad is he had a little bit of a rough patch, but he has been pitching better lately. And what I like about him a lot is when his stuff is tumbling down, that's when he is at his best. He cannot live up in the zone. So over his last 17 innings, 17 two thirds innings, excuse me, he's cracked up 29 ground balls. And that's where you need to be if you're Javier Assad. I like that. And I think with Javier Assad, I think the Chicago Cubs have a decent chance to win a ball game on a regular basis. I feel probably a little bit more confident right now about Javier Assad than I probably do with Jamison Tyone. I think with Jamison Tyone, I think you need to score some runs out there. I think Assad, I do think that you can win a 3-2 game. So I got two guys right now and one dude I'm on the fence with. Let's move on over to... Shota Imanaga. Shota Imanaga has literally single-handedly saved this Cubs season. We can go the other way and we could say, well, they've blown 22 leads. You give me seven of those back. Chicago Cubs might be close. Probably, well, they'll be close to first place. In the negative direction, if Shota Imanaga wasn't pitching for the Cubs this year, I don't even know what this season looks like. Shota this season, 10-3 and record, 3.08 ERA, 1.06 whip, still an all-star, still pitching great. They lost two of his last three starts, but overall for the season, when Shota Imanaga is on the mound, the Chicago Cubs are 18-6. and He is the Justin Steele of last year. AKA Cubs fans, when Shota Imanaga is on the mound for the next five weeks, the Cubs have to win. It is borderline must win when Shota Imanaga is on the mound. Because when he's out there, he gives you the best chance to win. And the best chance to win means that you have to come out there. You got to be ready to play. 21 of his 24 starts this year, he's allowed three or fewer runs. And I get it. He's coming over from overseas. It's his rookie season, even though he is a veteran professional baseball player. So you're starting to worry a little bit about, is he going to get worn down, wear and tear? You have seen some moments at times when teams can get the ball up in the air on him and they can take him deep. He gives up the occasional home run. What are the next five weeks going to look like? Well, the good news just for right now is that after a little bit of a bump, Shota seems to kind of righted the ship just a touch. And what I think the most out, what I like the most out of it is he's getting swing and miss right now. And swing and miss means that you're fooling the opposing hitter. And even more importantly, even on pitches when they are making contact, they struggle to make hard contact. And I think that's a positive sign for Shota Imanaga and the Cubs moving forward. Over his last 637 pitches, Shota is getting swinging strikes on 15% of them. That's a good number. That's up from even last month, up from the month before. So that stretch right now that he's in, he is getting some swing and miss. Maybe the strikeouts aren't exactly where they were. I mean, he's had a couple of really great performances. So it isn't so much about the strikeouts for me. It's about are you fooling these guys and are you getting some swing and miss? Because that can set up the rest of your arsenal.
And then you can really play around with the strike zone that way. But Shota Imanaga at 18 and 16 record. The Cubs, they got to win. They got to win every single one of those starts moving forward. And then the final guy, Kyle Hendricks, who by the time you're listening to this on a Thursday, maybe it's even a Friday. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're looking at another bad Kyle Hendricks start. And, and for me, I said at the beginning of the season that the Cubs have a Kyle Hendricks problem. He came back. He provided a couple of sol- solid outings. But honestly, you know, for me, from a Cubs fan's perspective, I mean, this might be the one thing that keeps them out of the playoffs if they can't replace Kyle Hendricks by the end of the season in the rotation. Because for me, I'll say it again, Kyle Hendricks pitching well is the surprise, not the expectation at this time in his career. And that's a tough one if you're going to roll him out every fifth day in September trying to make the playoffs. Team record as of this taping, I'm not giving up on this Cubs game just yet, is 7-16. and 16. It could be 7-17 and 17 by the time you listen to this. He's got a personal record of 3-10. and 10. 6.33 ERA. We mentioned a little bit about FIP. It is a little bit better in Kyle Hendricks' case at 5.24. And over his last 11 starts, it has been a little bit better at a 4.35 ERA, 1.17 whip. But again... He's a little bit like that Indiana Jones scene where he's trying to step on the right letters, and if he steps on the wrong one, he falls to an eternal abyss. And that's a little bit like Kyle Hendricks every time he's out there on the mound. He has to hit every single letter correctly, or the ground will fall out beneath him. And it really is razor thin. And unfortunately... When your manager, Craig Council, I think it opens him up to wide criticism. Because if, you're, if you catch a whiff that Kyle Hendricks doesn't have it, which he probably doesn't on a regular basis anymore, you have to go to your bullpen early. You have to be ready to do it. And then there's other moments where he tries to see if he can get those three, four innings out of Kyle. Kyle will sometimes give it to him, but more likely he's given up those five or six runs and really putting his whole team in a hole very quickly. So with Kyle Hendricks... They got nobody else right now. They really don't. So I understand what they're trying to do with him right now. But but him out there every single day, man, you got to score runs even more than Jamison Tyon. I mean, it's an offense day to the max. And honestly, if I was Craig Council, I would start thinking about maybe in that second or third inning, really preparing somebody else to come into the game. Even if Kyle's pitching well, you can't roll the dice too much because if you keep trying to hit those letters sooner or later, you're going to hit the round, the wrong one and you are going to fall. You're going to fall far. Let's move on over to the offense. A unit that's gotten way better. I have to admit I've had my criticisms who wouldn't they were right in front of our eyes. And I want to start with Miguel Amaya, right? I've said, some derogatory things about Miguel Amaya. Do I think he's a long-term fit for the Chicago Cubs? I don't know. And it's been well documented that he had this leg kick that he ran out for the first 180-something at-bats of the season, was hitting 195. He eliminated it, went to a little bit more of a quieter toe-tap step to load and release. And the results have been amazing. Since the All-Star break, Miguel Amaya is hitting 349 on base percentage 386 slugging percentage 566 OPS 952 people in the month of August he has seven games of multi hits over his last seven days of this taping he's 14 to 25 he's hitting 560 now I get it he's not really like kind of hitting the cover off the ball he's hitting it getting some grounders getting some CNI balls get to the get to the outfield but again he has been hitting the ball with more authority And thank goodness, because this Cubs lineup was short all season long. Him and the guy that we're going to get to next PCA, I mean, those were automatic outs at that 8-9 spot. And it's nice, at the very least, that the opposition has to plan or at least work against Miguel Amaya and PCA again. It's been great to see. It's been about 100 at-bats, maybe less, maybe around 95. So not quite matched what his first half what his awful first half of 180 something is, but look, he doesn't have to hit 340 in September, but he has to keep trying to be as consistent as possible. 
and roll it into the offseason. But, I mean, it is, it is a positive sign. I'm hesitant to give Craig Council some credit for this right now, but keep an eye on this, Cubs fans, that there could be easily a narrative heading into the offseason that why was Craig Council hired over, you know, why was David Ross fired? Why was Craig Council hired? Part of it, one of the narratives, was that David Ross was reluctant to play young kids and stick with them through the tough times. Craig Council was known as someone that liked to play younger players in Milwaukee and was able to develop more talent. I'm not going to say that Miguel Amaya and PCA turning their second half of their season around all on Craig Council, but I will say that he's kept them in the lineup hell or high water. I mean, even when it was at its worst, both of these guys were in the 190 range and Council kept running out PCA, kept running out Miguel Amaya. And that type of patience, to Craig Council's credit, has to this point paid off. Whether these are long-term pieces for the Chicago Cubs, we're going to find out. And whether they can keep it up over the next five weeks, we're going to chronicle and root for. But it is nice to see these moments where these young players are actually working through the struggles at the major league level and starting to find a little success. And speaking of success, we're starting to see what all the hype about Pico Armstrong was about. Just a little bit, right? We all knew about the outfield play. We continuously see the speed on the base paths. He's now got 26 stolen bases on the year, only been caught once. But man, when he hits the ball in the gap, look out, stand up and get ready. Six triples already on the year, seven home runs now. He's up to that mark. He had an inside the parker the other day against Miami. That was absolutely amazing. If anyone, YouTube it. Check it out. Do whatever you got to do. Check this out. They clocked him at 30 miles an hour at one point. That is some kind of fast, guys. Now, look, his OPS for the season is still below the 700 mark, which I consider the average for a major league hitter. It's at 658, but it's rising. Over his last 49 at-bats, can't deny it. Hitting 306, on base 382, slugging 633. And he's not just looking to turn and burn anymore, people. He's hitting the ball to the opposite field. He's hitting the ball to center field. And you're seeing a little bit more about what the potential and what the hype was all about with PCA. He's got hits in 16 of his 24 games played in August. That's also important to me because for a young kid, you know, we could look at stats at the end of the year and a guy can rack up nine RBIs in two, two days. That's baseball, right? It goes, on the, it goes on the car, but doesn't really reflect the entire season. The fact that he continuously, every single day, keeps getting hit, scoring some runs, I really like it. And it's reflective in the strikeout numbers, too, as well. Pre-All-Star break, he had 45 strikeouts, 158 bats. He's had 110 at-bats since the All-Star break, and he's only struck out 19 times. Hitting 245 in general in since the All-Star break, 12 extra base hits, 464 slugging. I'm liking what I'm seeing. Keep it going. We need that kind of energy, and he's another guy. I think he could be an X-factor of not to carry us, but he has to play this way the next five weeks to even give us a chance to get to the postseason. Cody Bellinger hitting the ball with a little more authority, 489 slugging post-All-Star break. Look, I... You know, the home run numbers are not going to be where they want to be. The dude is going to opt back in. I'm fairly confident he's probably going to be a Chicago Cub in 2025. And I'll be honest with you, I'm okay with it. I've said this before on Sports Talk Chicago. Take the numbers out of it. And and please just watch Cody Bellinger play for a week. The dude is a professional, sturdy, stable, smart baseball player. I know it's not in vogue, and I know it hurt his hard hit rate in the offseason and his exit velocity, but I love the fact that with two strikes, he chokes up, shortens up his swing, and he tries to poke it somewhere, and he's picked up numerous base hits that way. I mean, I I get it. He's only got 13, 14 home runs right now, but with that type of approach and his smarts, guess who's leading the team with runners in scoring position? It's Cody Ballinger. He's hitting 327 with runners in scoring position. He's slugging 490. Would I love for him to get hot and start hitting the ball at the ballpark? Sure. And he could probably play a little bit better than he's playing right now, but I'm not worried about him. He just needs to keep doing what he's doing. He had a bad September last year, so he needs to just keep building on some of the habits that he's been forming the last two or three weeks, and I, I just need him to be Cody Bellinger, and we're going to be fine with that. 
One guy we kind of need to see to turn around a little bit is our rookie, Michael Bush. And if you kind of look at the numbers, you can tell he had that great home run streak to start the year, cooled off, to his credit, made an adjustment, got hot. And now you can see that he's back in adjustment mode again. He's going to have to figure that out because over his last 103 at-bats, he's only hitting 204. A guy that knows the strike zone really well on base percentage, only 287 in that span. OPS below average, 668 post-All-Star break. My thing is, can he get it going again? I mean, is he running out of gas because he's a rookie? I don't know. He's 26 years old. He's played many minor league seasons before. I think he's just kind of a streaky guy that needs to get back into a good mode again. And maybe you have to give him a couple days off here and there like you did last night, or excuse me, on Tuesday night when you gave Talkman the start instead of Bush. Give him a breather to kind of recollect and reset himself and get him ready for this stretch run because there have been at times where if you count, you know, OPS plus and and all these different kinds of, uh, you know, WRC, he's been one of our better hitters, if not our best hitter all season long, all around. And we need this guy. In the two-hole runners in scoring position, only hitting 209. I mean, honestly, at this point, we just need him hitting the ball with authority, making good contact, and getting on base, setting himself up for the Sayas of the world, the Cody Bellingers of the world, and and hopefully just go from there. Ian Happ, I don't have much to say about Ian Happ because all I can say about Ian Happ is he is just consistent. <laughs> He's a consistent dude. Look how consistent Ian Happ is. In May, he hit 231, hit five home runs. In June, hit 244, hit five home runs. In July, hit 253, six home runs. In August, 247, hit six home runs. I mean, look, I know there's people that like to complain about Ian Happ, but the dude gets on base, and you can say what he wants. He's just consistent in what he's going to give you. He's going to hit 240 to 250. And if you just count these numbers here, he's going to hit you about five home runs a month. So I don't know how much hotter, how much colder he's going to get. He can't, he can't get too much colder. We just need him to stay consistent at the top of that lineup. And, and him in the leadoff spot has worked um, as the Chicago Cubs try and work their way back into possibly making a playoff spot. Moving on over to Nico Horner. Honestly, not much to say. I love watching Nico Horner play. He plays with passion. You know, he's got 25 stolen bases. I like that. The defense has gotten better as the year has gone along. But, man, it just he's just been average. And it just and it hurts to say there's not much up or much down about him. He does not hit for power. And here's the problem. I get the Ian Happ in the leadoff spot because he's been getting on base. He's shown a little thump. And I understand Michael Bush, too, as well, because of his knowledge of the strike zone. But it kind of puts Nico into a tough spot. I I am curious if we'll see, right? I mean, do they have the guts to move Amaya up in the lineup if he stays this hot? Because Nico, man, hitting in the sixth, seventh hole, and you got runners in scoring position, and he's hitting only 232 in those situations, and he's only slugging 326. Slugging 326, we all know Nico Horner doesn't have pop, but in that sixth, seven hole right there, that is just a tough one, man. It's a tough spot for him to be in. And I don't think that's a fit for him. I think he's probably an eight, nine hitter and a guy that can maybe help turn the lineup over a little bit. And you can just hit the ball hard somewhere and make contact. But in that six, seven hole slung at 326, it just ain't, it's just not going to get it done. And, and he's been average. I don't know if he can get hot. We just need him to sort of stay the same. And honestly, if you're Nico Horner, I just want him to play great defense over the next five weeks. And I think that will give you the right kind of shot that you need to possibly make the playoffs. Moving on, Isak Paredes. There's not much that I can say. He's been bad. I still would make the trade. He's better defensively than Chris Morrell. But man, oh man. If you want to know how bad it's been, let's go back to Miguel Amaya. When we were giving Miguel Amaya a hard time, he was hitting 205 through 182 at bats. That was Miguel Amaya's first half, and the criticisms rained down upon him. Isak Paredes, his last 160 at bats, he's hitting 144. 144. That's, that's not even Adam Dunn territory. Okay, that's that's getting close to Martin Maldonado territory. 
And the hardest part, too, is that he's only slugging 371 against right-handed bats. So I'm hoping that he can turn it around, right? We all hope that he can turn it around. But, man, it has been bad. He's in the slump in the worst kind of way. They traded for him mid-slump, hoping to maybe turn around. But, man, when you're looking for that jolt at that trade deadline, when you bring someone in, he just hasn't provided it. I mean, he's probably making more contact than Chris Morrell would have. But, man, it's been tough sledding. He's got five weeks to turn it around. And, and I hope, I hope Paredes shows us the player that he was last year with Tampa because we haven't seen it to this point in the Chicago Cubs, and, and, it's, and it's been tough. Last two guys, and actually I kind of think these guys are really important. I want to start with Dansby Swanson first. I've been giving Dansby a hard time all season. He still has not had a very good year. He's hitting against right-handers only 215, slugging only 331. Not good enough, guys. He has played better, though. Over the last 97 at-bats or so, hitting 268, 443 slug. On-base percentage has been nice, 348. That's a good clip for Dansby Swanson. But, man, it's his swing, I talk about it a lot. His swing doesn't have a lot of plate coverage. It is only kind of one way. He really can't handle different kinds of pitches with his swing path. He really has to just stay on it, guess correctly, and try and put some good wood on it. He's been racking up RBIs over the last couple of days, so I know maybe by the end of the offseason we are going to look back and be like, well, he did have 65 RBIs. Well, he's gotten seven of them in the last two days. And I'm not saying we need him to hit 300, but I say, I'm saying we need to have him continue to hit that 268 right there with a little bit of that slug. Because, man, Nico Horner's not going to do it for you in the 6-7 hole, and we just got done with Paredes, and he's not hitting at all. So who's it going to be, folks? If we're taking up, if PCA and Amaya are now hitting, are the now are the black holes in the lineup now going to be Paredes and Swanson? We can't have that. One of those guys has got to sort of figure it out, and I'm thinking it's going to be Swanson. Paredes, uh, you know, he's he's in a bad way. He's hitting in a bad way right now. That is a deep, deep, deep slump, um, and I'm not sure what they do moving forward to change that. Is there a call-up coming in September? Could Nico Horner play third for a couple days and they bring up a guy to play second? I, I don't know. Grasping at straws a little bit on that one, but I think Dansby has the opportunity to pick it up and give them an opportunity to make our offense a little bit better on the back half. And then finally, my X factor, my guy, this dude is the key to the whole thing. Say a Suzuki. I know, picking the best hitter in the lineup, Joey. Really smart, really cool. But here's the deal. We all remember last year, and over his last 115 at-bats this year, he's slugging 583. That's all-star type numbers, folks. His OPS is 904 since the all-star all -Star break, easily leading the team. All-star numbers, folks. He's getting hot right now, and I'm rooting for a say us a I'm rooting for a say of September is what I need. September say of last year, slash 370, 434, 685. Drove in 26 runs in the month. I will go out on a limb and say, if he gives us even something of a whiff of that, I think the Chicago Cubs got a great shot at making the postseason. Don't need to hit 370, but if you hit over 300 and you slug at that type of clip, and he has been. He's already been showing it. I think that's where the Chicago Cubs maybe sort of unlock something and surprise some people and get back into this wild card race. And hopefully with that last week of the season, they're within shouting distance, a.k.a. a game or two from the playoffs. But we need that September Seiya. I love the nickname. He needs a moniker. Maybe this is his time. Maybe this is his time of year. He's getting hot right now in August. He needs to carry it through to September. And if he can... The Cubs, maybe, just maybe, might make the postseason. That's going to do it for here, us here on Sports Talk Chicago. I'm Joey Christopoulos. Thank you so much for tuning in. You can follow me at Joey Sports Guy. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube. Tell your friends. 
Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for supporting. I want to thank our great radio affiliates across the great state of Illinois, 98.3 The Life, WKAN, 105.5 The Ticket, ACTV, JED TV, WJOB, Cities 92.9 Talk FM, WROK Rockford, and 1011 Peoria Sports Radio. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be well, be safe. Please be good to each other. I will check you next week. Make sure you come on back because I'm going to do my full official Bears season prediction breakdown. Can't wait to do it. Football is almost here. Enjoy the week. We'll talk to you soon.